rendezvous promising more groundbreaking breakthroughs. China's first female astronaut, inspiring more to follow. The Tiangong-1 has been orbiting the Earth for months. Is the Shenzhou 9 docking the dawn of China's permanent space presence? Find out the answers on CCTV News special live coverage of China's most ambitious manned space mission to date. Welcome to CCTV News, and this is a special coverage on China's Shenzhou 9 mission. I'm Zhou in Beijing. In just 30 minutes from now, China's manned spacecraft, Shenzhou 9, will conduct another extremely challenging test, manual docking with the Space Lab Module Tiangong-1. In fact, today's manual docking is regarded as the most demanding task of the crew. It is so difficult that China's space authorities have made it clear the Shenzhou 9 mission as a whole wouldn't be a complete success without today's operation being successful. To achieve today's feat, the astronauts have gone through thousands of simulation tests here on the ground to make sure that they can cope with any emergency involved. But there are still a lot of uncertainties ahead in space. And space experts describe the manual docking as threading a needle between two objects flying at high speeds. For a better understanding, of how Shenzhou 9 crew are carrying out their tasks and what their daily lives are like in space. We are joined uh, by our panelists here in the studio. They are Dr. Yang Yiguang from China Aerospace, uh, Aerospace Science and Industry Cooperation and Mr. Wang Baozhi, Vice Director of the Simulator Research Department of China's Astronaut Research and Training Center. And also we have Professor John Lewis from the University of Arizona. Well, welcome, gentlemen. Later in our program, my colleague Wang Mama will be taking up through the science and technology picture behind Shenzhou 9 mission. But first, the Shenzhou 9 spacecraft has detached from Tiangong 1 space lab in preparation for a manual docking maneuver. The three astronauts return to the re entry module of Shenzhou 9 after six days aboard the two unified vehicles. The spacecraft then retreated to a distance about 400 meters from the Tiangong-1 lab. The command center on the ground then sent orders to begin the operation. After testing the craft's handling, the astronauts then brought the craft to a 140 meters from the lab in preparation for their manual docking. Well, Saturday marks the fifth day of joint flight for Tiangong-1 and Shenzhou-9. The day was also China's traditional Dragon Boat Festival here on the ground. The Shenzhou 9 crew send their best wishes at the occasion of this traditional festival. The Shenzhou 9 crew send best wishes from space to all Chinese people around the world. Happy Dragon Boat Festival. We appreciate all the support from the ground. Thank you for securing a safe flight for us. Well, the crew marked the day over a lunch of traditional Chinese rice puddling. Uh, pudding, actually. Over the past five days, they have already successfully carried out five medical experiments. Well, they are China's first physiological studies and experiments in microgravity. There are in total ten experiments on board, on, and including microbiological tests and monitoring of uh, biological rhythms. Well, the spacesuits are the most important single item in the design of a space mission's life support system for the astronauts. For more about the unique design of Shenzhou 9 crew's spacesuits, let's turn to my colleague Wang Mama and also our expert consultant, Professor Wu Ji, for an explanation. Well, thanks very much. So, yeah, today we're going to take a closer look at the spacesuits. And joining us again in the studio is Professor Wu Ji. He is the Director General of the National Space Science Center of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Thanks for joining us, Professor. Hello. Professor Wu and I will be breaking down the different parts of a spacesuit. But first, let's take a look at the big overall outfit. They are the most complicated and expensive outfits you can find. And they function as a personal spacecraft and there are incredible devices that can really keep the astronauts alive. 
Given the importance of these suits, how expensive can they be? They can be very expensive. There are two kinds of spacesuit. One's used internally, one's used outside of the spacecraft. So the, for the one used outside of spacecraft, it could cost three million US dollars. And for the one uh, the astronaut used inside of the spacecraft is 10 times less. All right, let's break them down to smaller parts for our audience. And we're going to start from the top, the helmet. The helmets not only protect the astronaut's head, but they also provide oxygen. That's right. You can see the connections uh, between the helmet and also the uh, suit, and it was uh, tightened. And because the inside the spacesuit, uh, there's uh, air pressure. So the, the helmet also keep the air pressure, and beside it can provide communication between the astronaut and the ground control center. All right, and now let's move on to the next part, which is the control button in the upper torso. Yes, uh, here you can see, uh, here is a control button. This is also important because in general, the electricity provided uh, to the spacesuit is come from outside, from the spacecraft. And only at the emergency uh, situation, uh, we have to, the astronaut has to use batteries. Normally we use outside electricity, and if you turn this button, it will switch to the battery electricity. So this is also a very important device. Okay, and moving on to another simple part, that's the pressure reader. That's right. The, the air pressure inside the suit uh, will be shown here, and uh, the astronaut can read the value and uh, how, uh, how much, yes and how much the, the inside uh, value is. And in case there's a, a problem, they have to adjust device and to give warnings to the ground control center. All right, and now uh, Professor Wu is going to go through the different layers of a spacesuit that's worn inside the cabin. And the one at the very bottom is the one that's closest to the astronaut's skin. Yes, we can call this uh, inner part uh, interface layer. And uh, in the middle is isolation layer. It can uh, isolate the air pressure uh, from the internal uh, suit and to the outside environment. And on the top is the protection layer, and it will protect uh, any kind of scratch, any, any kind of uh, uh, poison gas, and so on. So this is a very important. Very interesting. So now let's watch a video clip of how okay. Chinese astronauts are wearing the in-cabin suit to perform their maneuvers. There are two kinds of spacesuits, and this is the kind of uh, spacesuits that's worn inside the cabin, and they are quite heavy, but not with loss of gravity. Yes, they and carry their own batteries, you can see, you, we have seen that. And they are worn when, during launch of the rocket. And also during re-entry. When they come back to the Earth, they have to wear it. Now let's move on to the next part. Uh, to get a better idea of how, of the difference between the spacesuit that's worn inside the cabin and the one that's worn for EVA, uh, let's see this illustration. What are the differences, Professor? Uh, there's a lot of differences. Uh, from, the, uh, from the design, it can protect a uh, very strong uh, space environment, like uh, extreme UV radiation and even particle radiation and also uh, temperatures. This is the most important. Like the spacecraft, uh, when the sun is shining on this side and the temperature is very high and the other side is very, very cold, so the difference could be 200 uh, uh, degrees. Uh, so there's a water cooling system inside. All right, and let's now break down them to the smaller parts. And this is the tether. I think this is the crucial part because it connects the astronaut to the spacecraft. Uh, it helps ensure that astronauts don't drift away. That's right. This is a called a safety tether, and uh, one end is connected with the spacecraft, and this end is connected with the suit. And here, this part. Uh, uh, that's that the electricity port. communication ca uh, connecting cable, and all the engineering pa pa parameters of the suit, and also the communication voices, and uh, there's many other parameters will be transmitted through this cable into the spacecraft and then go into the ground control center. And also the astronauts have this huge backpack uh, for their EVA and that contains all the systems that's needed to sustain them for a spacewalk. That's right. There's a machine to generate oxygen and also machine to take the exhaust uh, uh, waste uh, air uh, like uh, carbon dioxide and also to uh, 
uh, generate uh, the cooling waters and to balance the temperature of the body. And of course, most importantly, it has a warning system. And Professor, now let's watch a video of how Chinese astronauts are wearing these kind of suits to perform their EVA. This is China's Shenzhou 7 mission back in 2008 with yes. three astronauts on board. And uh, here we can see the safety tether. Yes, and we all remember that historic moment when he waves to the entire world saying, I'm out of the spacecraft and I feel fine. And so yeah, with the introduction of the spacesuits, we come to the end of our part for today. It's now back to you. Well, thank you, Ma Mao, and thank you, Professor Wu Ji. And we have our reporter Zhang Nini on the line at the Beijing Aerospace Command and Control Center. Uh, hello, Nini. Hello, Zhou Yue. So, what tasks the astronauts will perform this time around with manual docking? Well, right now we're getting closer to the big moment. On the big screen, we can see that the spacecraft is now parked at about 140 meters away from the space module. And uh, it will continue to park here until 12.37. That's about half an hour from now. And from that point on, the spacecraft will turn to the uh, ma menu rendezvous and docking. And right now, all the, uh, all the astronauts are in the Shenzhou-1 uh, re-entry module. And uh, just a uh, short while uh, ago, we see that the Liu Wang has already swapped seats with Jin Hanpeng, and uh, he will perform today's menu docking, uh, menu rendezvous and docking. And Jin Hanpeng is the chief commander of this mission, and during the menu docking process, he will be monitoring uh, this procedure and also issue uh, timely commands to Liu Wang, where Chinese astronaut, female astronaut Liu Yang will be check her astronaut handbooks to make sure that every procedure is taken correctly. And uh, over there, we see a list of important time frames of this mission at about uh, uh, three minutes past one o'clock, the docking passage will be set up and this will mark the completion of the manual rendezvous and docking. So yeah. Uh, we know we successfully docked with uh, Tiangong 1 and Shenzhou 9 uh, six days ago automatically. Why we schedule a manual docking in the middle of the mission? Well, this is indeed a very interesting question. Some would say that it would be more convenient to attempt the docking at the end of the mission when most of the experimental work inside Tiangong 1 is done. So, uh, but this menu docking occurs just halfway of the Shenzhou 9 mission. Why? Well, I've talked to some experts and they gave me some technical reasons for this. Uh, for starters, this is the sixth day of the Chinese astronauts in space. And from what we have mo been monitoring so far, they, they've been working and sleeping and well, and they also have been able to conduct a series of biological and experiments and also they, they're working out in the space. So it would be safe to try the manual docking now when the astronauts are still in optimal status instead of waiting to the end of the mission when there might be some uncertainties. And uh, secondly, this, is, this mission is more, uh, is more than just a test of the manual docking technology. It's also a test of the performance of the astronauts, their physiology and reaction during and after docking tests will be closely monitored. This is also part of the important biological experiment of this mission. So uh, I hope this could explain, uh, could give some reasons as to why uh, this uh, mission is arranged midway rather than at the end of the flight. So yeah. And, and Nini, many people are saying this is going to be a milestone for China's space program, but what kind of challenges the astronauts will uh, maybe meet when they perform the manually docking process compared with the automatic one. Well, yes, this is indeed a milestone. From this point on, the manual docking has put Chinese astronauts in the driver's seat, and that means during the past, they have gone to space uh, as passengers. Their, their vehicles in some automatic control, but right now, this, is, this will be the first time that they've been able to pilot this, this vehicle instead of just riding in it. But they did face several challenges. For example, the manual docking requires the astronauts to work nonstop for three hours on two vehicles of high velocity and in the meantime they need to deal with uh, all kinds of sickness caused by the microgravity environment and they're also subject to the lighting conditions if the lighting is too strong or too dark it might affect the visibility inside the cabin during the manual docking process whereas the automatic docking uh, uh, could avoid this human errors, but in case of emergency, it's not as flexible or reliable as the menu docking and relies a lot more on the ground support. So yeah. All right, thank you, Nini, for your reporting from the Beijing Aerospace Command and Control Center.
Well, in a short while, the three astronauts will conduct a historic manually docking process. Well, let's take a look at how 